Elite distance runners have been closing in on a two-hour marathon for more than a century. But the sport's last great barrier has proven elusive. For decades, the world's fastest times have fallen by mere seconds at a time. That was until earlier this year, when Elliot Kipchoge chopped a staggering two minutes and 32 seconds from the world's previous best time, coming just 25 seconds short of the two-hour mark. But his time doesn't qualify for world record status. That's because Kipchoge's race wasn't an official marathon. It was more like a carefully controlled experiment. Members of Nike's Breaking Two project spent four years and millions of dollars preparing three athletes for this race, optimizing everything from the shoes they wore to the course they raced on. Only Kipchoge came anywhere near Breaking Two. Understanding the science behind Kipchoge's race helps explain how he came so close and why this one race could forever change the way elite athletes run marathons. One of the most controversial elements of the Breaking Two project were the shoes. Kipchoge and the other runners ran in customized versions of the Vaporfly 4%, a shoe with a thick, springy sole and a carbon fiber plate that Nike claims can increase running economy by an average of 4%. But what does that 4% figure actually mean? And where did it come from? I'm Roger Crom. I'm a professor in the Integrative Physiology Department here at the University of Colorado Boulder, and we call this the Locomotion Lab. Nike knew from internal testing that the Vaporfly was fast, but when they needed someone to check their math, they called Crom. His lab is known for accurately measuring the energy that athletes expend during exercise. Uh, we built this one also ourselves in a machine shop. When we first built it, it was the first uh, force-measuring treadmill. A postdoc named Wouter Hogkammer led the investigation, comparing a prototype version of the Vaporfly to two other shoes, the Nike Streak 6 and the Adidas Audios Boost 2. At the time the study was performed, these two shoes or their predecessors had been worn in the 10 fastest marathons of all time. An Adidas shoe was worn by Dennis Kimeto and he set the world record. Now, the Audios Boost 2 weighed about 50 grams more than either of the Nike shoes, so Hogkammer used lead pellets to equalize the weight of all three. That way, he'd know that any energy saved with the Vaporfly would be because of its springy sole and carbon fiber plate, not its weight. Next, the test subjects performed a series of five-minute runs in each of the shoes, in different orders, on different days, while the researchers measured their oxygen consumption. When Krom's team calculated the metabolic cost of running in each shoe, they found about a 4% difference between the Vaporfly and the other two racing flats. All 18 test subjects responded a little bit differently, but each of them used between 2 and 6% less energy to run in the Vaporfly. There are, however, two big caveats. Number one, Nike did fund this research, but it was a well-designed study and the data is pretty compelling. The second caveat? The shoe's 4% advantage applies to test subjects running under ideal conditions for five minutes at a time. But the extent to which that advantage extends to an actual marathon is still unclear. Look at it this way. A 4% boost in efficiency should mean that a marathoner usually capable of running a 2.05 race would be able to slip on a pair of these shoes and run pretty close to a two-hour race, no problem. But that's not what we see in the real world which suggests that something is lost between a five-minute treadmill run and a 26.2-mile road race. The truth is, a marathon boils down to a bunch of different factors, and what you wear on your feet is just one of them. So, what other variables can you account for? I think it's just the level of control we had. We controlled the course extremely well, because I think a lot of the knowledge um, around optimum conditions for, for these types of events is, is reasonably well known. I mean, we did some, we did some fine, fine tuning. The racetrack at Monza gave Nike the control to optimize a bunch of factors known to affect running performance, like temperature, elevation, nutrition, even the turns in the course, all of which, when added together, probably had a pretty big impact on Kipchoge's race. Take turns, for instance. The more corners a course has, and the sharper they are, the more times a runner has to slow down or take a longer route, which adds up to valuable seconds over the course of a race. The same goes for hills. A flat course is generally preferable to one with a lot of ups and downs. Consider the Berlin Marathon. It only has a handful of sharp corners, and it's flatter than a lot of other big city marathons like London or New York. These qualities make Berlin a very fast course. On average, elite runners finish 81 seconds quicker in Berlin than they do at other races, which probably explains why every marathon world record in the last 15 years has been set in Germany. The junior circuit at Monza? It's even flatter than Berlin and has no sharp corners. 
In fact, the big sweeping curves at Monza ensured that Kipchoge and the other runners were always running the fastest, shortest route possible. The looped course also made it easier to deliver nutrition to the runners at regular intervals along the run. About the only thing Monza didn't have going for it was weather. Running generates body heat, and too much slows you down. Cold temperatures help runners dissipate heat, letting them run faster, longer. Numerous studies suggest that the ideal temperature for professional marathoners is below 50 or even 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But on race day at Monza, temperatures were a little higher than ideal. It was about 55 degrees and a little bit humid, and I wonder if they would have been able to go faster if it had been 5 or 6 or 10 degrees uh, cooler. That's Michael Joyner. He's a physician researcher at the Mayo Clinic and an expert in human performance. In 1991, he published a paper that predicted the ideal athlete, running under ideal conditions, could complete a marathon in 1 hour, 57 minutes, 58 seconds. We asked him what he thought made the biggest difference in Kipchoge's time, and he had a very clear answer. I think the three aspects of breaking two that contributed most heavily to the performance are the drafting, the pace car uh, providing a very steady pace the whole way, and also the runners who were both causing the windbreak but also participating in the drafting. In traditional marathons, pacers have to start the race with the runners, and they can only lead the pack as long as they're physically able. So they always drop out long before the race is over. But for breaking two, Nike cycled teams of pacers in and out of the race over the course of the entire run, in a finely tuned configuration never before seen in a marathon. To determine the ideal arrangement for blocking wind, Nike worked with aerodynamics expert Robbie Ketchell and the University of New Hampshire to test pacing formations in a massive wind tunnel. They tried a house configuration, an inverted Olympic ring, and a wall shape with two rows of three pacers. But the data showed the best configuration was the arrowhead shape you see here. That kind of advantage can shave minutes from a marathon time. But what about the pace car? In the days after the Breaking 2 race, a lot of people speculated that the pace car and the giant clock on top of it was providing an even bigger aerodynamic advantage than the pacers. Which is not a crazy theory. The sign was big, and the athletes were running pretty close to the car. Nike and Ketchell say the car and clock had a negligible effect on Kipchoge's performance. Of course, Nike would say that, but it's also probably true. Aerodynamics engineers Stephen Ferguson and Chris Beavis, who are unaffiliated with the Nike project, ran a full simulation of the benefits Kipchoge would have experienced in the wake of the Tesla and the Pacers. But according to their simulations, almost all of the drag reduction came from the pacers. Ferguson and Beavis estimate the car, clock, and pacers together might have saved Kipchoge as much as 4 minutes and 30 seconds, compared to running on his own. But the car and clock saved at most 26 seconds. And that's under ideal conditions. On race day, they might have saved Kipchoge half that. As for how the Breaking 2 project will affect the way marathons are run in the future, Every single expert we spoke to said the big thing they expect to see going forward are more coordinated pacing efforts. And or if a team was unified uh, under the same country or under the same sponsor, uh, then you had those four runners who did co-op. The term we came up with was cooperative drafting. And if you had cooperative drafting, even in the last uh, fourth of the marathon or so, uh, that could make a big difference. I think the other thing that'll be interesting will be to see if you get team races, Team Nike versus Team Adidas, or this country versus that country, uh, sort of like you have in cycling, where people could work together as sort of the running equivalent of a peloton. But the Breaking 2 project also shows that the two-hour boundary won't fall from pacing alone. Overcoming the marathon's 120-minute barrier will still require breakthroughs on multiple fronts. And so the arms race between shoe companies will continue in the form of ever lighter, bouncier, more propulsive shoes. Expect race organizers to optimize the conditions under which marathons are run. And most importantly, look for elite athletes like Eliud Kipchoge to continue pushing the limits of what's humanly possible. The hope for running under two hours was two minutes, 57 seconds. Now we are only 25 seconds away. <laughs>